Welcome, everybody, and um, I would just like to start by saying what an incredible honor it is to have uh, Professor Bhopal here today. We've just been having a long chat before this about her work, which is touches on so many areas um, of, around white privilege, race, higher education, and education in general, but also in other areas of life. And um, I uh, really urge you if you can, to get hold of this book, because it is an incredible piece of work insofar as she outlines so eloquently what white privilege is uh, empirically and what it does to society, to education, to, um, to the human experience and, uh, as such. Okay, so what I want to start by doing, I'm going to ask her a few questions and we'll open the floor to questions from, from you as well. And I just want to start actually with white privilege as a concept. Um, how can you tell us, Kalman, how you use this concept in the book? What does it mean to you? And also, maybe to outline a little bit about what it means in the context of education. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to say it's a huge pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to Joe and to Manali to invite me, and thank you all for coming tonight. So, white privilege is an interesting concept. So, I draw on the work of Peggy McIntosh, which I know is very dated, but Peggy McIntosh in the 1980s was one of the first academics in the US who described white privilege as a visible rucksack that you hold on your back. And in that invisible rucksack, you have these, these advantages, and they are, include passports, checkbooks, uh, and access to places. So white privilege entitles somebody to walk through customs without being stopped. White privilege means you can use a restroom without being arrested. White privilege means you can park your car without the police coming up to you and asking to see your license. So white privilege is something that exists all around us, particularly in the social structures that we embody, if you like. Now within higher education, the statistics show us that uh, if you are a black student, you are less likely to leave university with a 2-1 or a first-class degree. BME, academic, BME students, on the whole, are disadvantaged. And the way that white privilege manifests itself, manifests itself is through covert and overt forms of racism that BME and black students continue to experience. So it's the structural... Um, an institutional racism that exists in higher education. But it doesn't just exist for staff, it exists for students as well. So we only have 80 black professors in the whole of the UK. 25 of them are women. Um, and the BME category itself is underrepresented. And what these BME staff tell us is that they too experience racism. They experience racism from their colleagues, but they also experience racism from students. So that's how I talk about white privilege in relation to higher education. Thank you. Um, and yes, I mean, we know, for example, that student evaluations tend to consistently um, not favor BME staff. So it's very interesting. There are so many empirical examples of that type of way in which students, staff might also experience this from students, something that we don't highlight as much when we talk about racism in higher education. In the book, you talk a little bit about kind of a new race talk, and particularly in the context of the US, where you know um, <coughs> the, there's there, the, the conversation around race has moved a little bit in the last couple of decades to forms of conversation and typification of particularly black people, but uh, generally uh, um, people of color. Do you think that's something that you've seen in the UK as well over time? Do you think there's a change in the way that race is talked about, that racism is talked about? especially if you can give any, any examples from higher education. Mm -hmm. So I think what's, what's happened, certainly in terms of my lifetime as an academic over the last 25 years, um, I've seen that we've gone full circle. So in the current economic, political and social climate that we are, we are now living, we're about to leave the EU tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Trump has been elected. So these have been significant moments, historical moments, that have had a huge impact on how race and racism manifests itself. So what's happened is that we have individuals who are in positions of power. So we have Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, calling Muslim women letterboxes and so on and so forth. We have Trump using overtly racist language. So that's legitimised racism. So individuals now think that it's okay to be racist. It's acceptable to be racist. And this is evidenced in the statistics where we have, throughout the whole of Europe, the rise of the far right. So the far right are, are also gaining momentum. So within the, so in the, in the public discourse, racism has now become legitimised. Within higher education, we have a shift in, because of neoliberalism, 
we, we're, we're moving backwards instead of forwards. So one of the major failures of neoliberal policymaking that I argue in the book mm. is that it's made, it's made the situation worse for people of colour, particularly in higher education. That's why those numbers, those statistics are so stark. Mm. So, for instance, we have policy making that is disguised to be inclusive. So we have the Race Equality Charter, we have the Athena Swan Charter, and we have universities that are suddenly interested in these issues. So on the one hand, the public discourse is that racism is okay, it's legitimized. On the other hand, we have universities who feel they have to address these issues. Now, from a critical race perspective, I look at that and I argue that this is a process of interest convergence, whereby universities are only interested in the Race Equality Charter because it benefits them. They can sell themselves as fair and inclusive and tick the box, because what, the, what are they worried about? They want to ensure that when parents look at universities, they want that university to have social justice at the heart of its agenda. So they can recruit students. Why? Because students are paying fees. So it's a, the marketization of higher education is significantly related to race. Okay, that's a really interesting connection there, actually. Um, I was going to ask you about the Race Equality Charter as well in a second, but I just wanted to come back to the whiteness in the, in the university, and particularly in the classroom. You talk a little bit about the role of the lecturer um, or the teacher, you know, in, in the classroom, uh, in your book, actually. And you, you mentioned sort of the ways in which um, lecturers have a kind of responsibility to, especially white lecturers, have a responsibility to actually deal with their own prejudice, their own conceptions of race, and how they present the material. Do you want, can you tell us a little bit about that? You know, what, what does that mean for the kind of pedagogy that we're all engaged in? So that brings me on to, to, to thinking, as you were asking the question, to thinking about um, what we call decolonizing the curriculum mm. and the curriculum itself. So one of the things that I found um, when I was doing research <laughs> in the book was that uh, what was evident and what was clear is that our curriculum does not represent the communities that we serve. Okay? So we have high numbers of students who are from, who are international students, who are BME students, or from marginalized communities. And teachers go into the, class, into the classroom, but they are not prepared to teach about these issues. And they are not prepared to understand how to deal with issues of racism when these occur in the classroom. So we're at fault here as educationalists because we are not training our teachers mm. properly to understand that they are in a position of responsibility. So they have to understand that what they teach is important, but also they have to understand how to deal with issues of racism and what that means for the relationship that they have with students. And at the moment, I would argue that that is not happening. Right, no, definitely. Um, and uh, so, uh, when you talk about Athena Swan, um, in your book you talk a lot about the ways in which white women in particular have benefited from uh, policies of inclusion and diversity, while this has just not happened for BME women and BME people in general. What do you think are the, I mean, in your view, sort of the major barriers to, you know, the way in which Athena Swan has actually been quite successful in bringing women into senior leadership positions, professorial positions, I mean, there is still a, a some ways to go, but the, the incredible sort of, there's, there's a barrier that BME staff are not able to cross. Um, what do you think is, is happening here? Okay, so the reason, uh, to, to put it bluntly, if I may, the reason that's that happened, and it's certainly my analysis when I've looked at all the policy making, certainly through the last 10, 15 years, the reason that's, that that's happened is because gender has taken precedence over race. Mm. So when you talk about inequalities, it's always about gender. So when I give lectures, and I give lectures about racism, I'm always asked, how do you know it's racism? When I give lectures about gender, I'm never asked, how do you know it's sexism? So gender has taken precedence over race throughout policy making and throughout the intellectual project around inequalities and social justice. So consequently, women of colour and men of colour have been left behind because race is always given a secondary priority. So what happens is, within Athena Swan, when, Athena, when it was announced that Athena Swan was going to include intersectionality, mm. the research that, that I've conducted at Birmingham showed that, that people were really worried about that because they felt as though what happens is, within that agenda of inequality, race gets lost. So gender all, will always take precedence 
above that, above race. And if you look at the statistics in terms of the progression of white women in higher education, they have benefited most from all policy making. And it's white middle class women who are the main beneficiaries of Athena Swan. Just like in the US, the main beneficiaries of affirmative action are white working class women. So even though we have these policies in place, from a critical race perspective, I argue that these are for the benefit of the universities, not for the benefit of the group that they are meant to serve. And one of, the, one of the barriers also, as you outline in the book, is the very, very low representation or almost not negligible representation of BME staff at higher levels of uh, policy making, management, and so on and so forth. So that representation itself has its own feedback effects upon these sorts of things, that, that racism is not recognized as being particularly real in the higher, higher education setting. So, so what we have then, it's what I call um, a discourse of denial. So universities want to sell themselves as fair, inclusive, with social justice at the heart of their agenda. So they tick the boxes. They say we have these inclusion programs, we've got the race equality charter, but this is not evidence in outcomes and objectives and realities. So if you look at a university, you have to just look at the statistics in terms of who's at the top, who's at the second layer, who's in the Senate, et cetera, et cetera. So BME women and men are less likely to occupy senior decision-making roles, which is important here, because I argue in the book, this is, this is, a, this is, this, this is no accident. It's intentional because it's a way in which white, white groups will continue to protect their own white privilege and their whiteness and perpetuate and reinforce those positions of power. Because by us, people of color, occupying those roles, their whiteness will be threatened. Right. I mean, you say in, it, it's not so much in the book. In this, there's an article, a wonderful article, same old story, just a different policy, race and policy making in higher education in the UK. And you talk a lot about the performativity of the REC, the Race Equality Charter. And one of the interesting things you say there is that the REC addresses <coughs> perceptions about racism rather than actual racism. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by that? Yeah. So um, this, this article was published as based on a study that we conducted um, on the Race Equality Charter. It's one of the first pieces of research. And what we argue is that um, we, we, took, we look at the way in which the Race Equality Charter is an enactment of policy making. So we say that basically when the Race Equality Charter takes place, Universities are, it's a performativity of race. It's an enactment of how that happens. So there is this perception that racism, racism isn't really real. So when individuals complain about racism, what happens is this is often dismissed by managers as a clash of personalities. Oh, don't be silly, it's not racism. So there's a, a discourse of denial that racism actually happens. And we all know that it's very difficult to prove uh, to, to prove or disprove racism in higher education. So our respondents said to us that if for my colleague, my colleague would have to hit me over the head with a baseball bat and call me a packy, and then that's racism. But it's the microaggressions, the subtle, covert nuances of racism that take place in higher education, for, not just for staff, <laughs> Not just for staff, but for students. I'll let you answer that. It must be really <laughs> urgent. <laughs> Not just for staff, but also for students, because students tell us that they too experience these microaggressions. Not just from their peers, but from white academics. So, so, so the situation is not just for students, but staff yeah. are also experiencing these issues. And, and I'm sure you yourself, in terms of your UCU role, have have actually seen that as well. Sorry, I'm not supposed to be asking you questions. <laughs> no, but it is true that you know we did a staff survey last year, I think, and uh, about a third of staff who filled out the survey said they had witnessed harassment or bullying of fellow BME colleagues. I mean, this is not just academic, but academic-related staff as yeah. well. So that's, I mean, that's quite high proportion of people who actually just witnessed. We didn't really get enough data on <coughs> the actual incidents of harassment, but there is enough to show that that's quite widely pre prevalent. But I think the, the distinction, I mean, the, the, the fact, I mean, what you're drawing our attention to is that a lot of it is not what is often collapsed under the term harassment, because I think that ends up being very, um, that black puts something in a box and says, well, it has to be of a certain kind to qualify as yeah. racism, but that the everyday microaggression that 
most people of color would know exactly what I'm talking about in this room that is so difficult to pinpoint mm -hmm. and that wears you down mm -hmm. after a while. And we've all, I think, had instances of that in conversations over college dinners or in the, you know, by colleagues in the passageway, some of them being coded through other things like your culture, for example, you know, but it's, a bit, uh, yeah, anyway. So I think the fact that you draw attention to that is really, really very useful. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about this performativity as well, and I know we, we've got a few more minutes, so just last couple of questions, just about the performativity and thinking about um, how does this gaming, as you call it, you know, the rec, sort of as a gaming thing, mm. it's, first of all, it's voluntary, mm. so it's not required by any university to, to, carry, to, 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 to carry this exercise. Not yet. This exercise. <laughs> not yet. Um, but how... Um, uh, how can you actually address racism? So the, how do you move from the realm of perception to actually address it? My experience is that not, there are no real policies with any real teeth in them mm -hmm. to get to the core of what's going on. How do you? Think well, you? this is a real problem actually, and I'm glad you've asked that question because um, it takes me back to uh, the quote that I always use, and that is that you know a failure to acknowledge racism results in a failure to act. Mm -hmm. And what we have is higher education institutions and universities. Firstly, they fail to acknowledge that their inst that, that, that their institutions are racist. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest, higher education is racist. Okay, that's evidenced by the quantitative data and the qualitative data that we've had, and we have huge amounts of data that have been telling us year after year after year, but nothing changes. So the problem is, there are pockets of excellence actually. There are some universities that have mechanisms in place um, which, which, which actually are very clear in terms of what to do to report racism or, as you say, I mean, that, that's a whole new uh, ball game, the harassment, calling it harassment yeah. is. Let's call it for what it is, yeah. it's racism. So there are good mechanisms in place, uh, good structural mechanisms, but there's also very poor practice where there are no mechanisms in place. So individuals in some universities who are experiencing racism, firstly they feel they cannot complain for fear of reprisal and lo of losing their jobs and being penalised. And there's a huge amount of evidence to show that when complaints of racism are made, the victim becomes the villain. So when you do make a complaint about racism, and this is not just for staff, it's students as well, it's switched the other way. So instead of a manager saying, okay, well, let's investigate this as racism, it's, it's switched the other way so that the question is, are you sure it's racism? So it works from the wrong premise. So we should be working from the fact, we should think, how should we support this? Let's see how this happened. But the question is immediately a, a question of doubt. Are you sure it's racism? So we're working from the wrong premise. And the reason why higher education institutions do that is because they are failing to address and acknowledge that they are racist. Because they cannot believe that higher education institutions, which are liberal, social justice at the heart of their agenda, how can we possibly be racist? Because we are forward thinking. And I think that is the crux of the issue. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's really helpful. And I think the cloud of doubt, as we were talking about earlier, always hangs over BME staff and students. You know, are you really good enough? You know, it's this, the doubt of your, the value of what you have contributed is always something that keeps BME staff always feeling like they're not quite where they need to be. You know, that's another mechanism, another kind of invisible mechanism, because it's just there in what's left unsaid, rather than even what's said, that keeps this feeling, you know, this, this hierarchy in place. Mm -hmm. um, so, thank you so much for that. It was really helpful. I think it would be really great to hear some questions. Can I just from... answer to yeah. what you've just said? Yeah, sorry, go find yeah. Is Of course. Okay? No, no, so I think that's a really important point that yeah. you brought up, because yeah. I think constantly, as an academic, academics of colour are constantly comparing, having to, or being made to compare themselves to their white colleagues. So they have to be twice as good. Yeah. They have to publish twice as many books, brings twice as much money in all the time. And for the research that I did on BME academics, some of my respondents, though not all of them, were doing research on equity and social justice. And they were told that that's not real research, that's personal research. So that they are constantly belittled yeah. throughout their careers and trajectories in higher education. Well, 
just to add to that, on the one hand, that's seen as personal research. On the other hand, you're always taught to stay in your lane. You should really research mm -hmm. where you came from. So there's always this sense that you're the best spokesperson for your culture, mm -hmm. and you should be talking, you should be researching yeah. that. So it's, it's like you can't win. <laughs> it's really, um, so anyway, thank you so much, Kelvant, and, and let's take some questions. Thank you.